Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. The U.S. Court of Appeals upholds the dismissal of a lawsuit in Ames versus the AWRL. Ballots are counted in the 2017 AWRL Director and Vice Director elections. AWRL section managers will begin new terms of office on January 1st. Radio Caroline in the UK is heard on 648 kilohertz as it prepares to return to the airwaves. The launch of Rad FX set is reset for November 18th. The league announces that 630 and 2200 meters will be eligible for the grid chase contest. And a sovereign nation in space? That appears to be what is happening, and we'll have all the details along with this week's propagation forecast in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites orbiting the Earth. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be along to tell us about synthetic realities and file recovery do's and don'ts. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, asks, what did you hear on the bands last week? And we will have the second part of a talk given at the 2017 Dayton Hamvention on FT8 and other digital modes given by Lauren Pugh, KC9L. That's all straight ahead as edition number 977 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility in a nondescript building here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where the Christmas lights are on in Washington Park and Christmas music just started on the FM broadcast bands, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where the weather keeps changing its mind on a daily basis, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And reporting from the western Catskills of New York, where a slight film of snow covers the greenery just in time for the opening of deer season, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off this week's news, a lawsuit filed by former AWRL Eastern Pennsylvania Section Manager Joseph Ames, W3JY, of Malvern, Pennsylvania, against AWRL and several of its officers and board members was dismissed with prejudice by the United States District Court in Philadelphia in December 2016. For more details on this story, we go to Carl Pereira. KC1 HSX reporting from League Headquarters. Ames filed an appeal of that decision, and on November 11th of this year, the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit upheld the lower court's dismissal of the suit. In its opinion, the appellate court wrote, quote, because the record shows that Ames acted contrary to an August 2015 directive on at least two occasions, the ARRL statement that Ames repeatedly acted contrary to the directive is true and cannot support a claim for defamation. It is apparent on the face of the complaint and related documents that statements in the ARRL news article are true, and the district court therefore correctly held that the defendants established a complete defense to the Ames defamation claim and appropriately dismissed the complaint. Close quote. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. In June 2016, the executive committee of the AWRL Board of Directors relieved Ames of his appointments in the AWRL field organization, including his position as chairman of the AWRL National Traffic System Eastern Area. The votes are in and the ballots have been tallied at ARRL headquarters in contested director and vice director elections. In a two-way race to fill the Dakota Division Director's Chair being vacated by Kent Olson, KA0LDG, the division's members have elected Matt Holden, K0BBC of Bloomington, Minnesota. Holden, the current Vice Director, received 698 votes, while Dean Summers, N0ND of Dickinson, North Dakota, got 345 votes. Holden had been appointed as vice director in February 2016 after former director Greg Whitten 
K0GW became ARRL first vice president. Olson announced earlier this year that he would not seek another term. In a four-way race for the vice director's chair that Holden will vacate, the winner was Lynn Nelson, W0ND of Minot, North Dakota. Nelson earned 427 votes. Tom Karnowskis, N0UW of Owatonna, Minnesota, received 338 votes. Chris Stalkamp, KI0D of Selby, South Dakota, got 175 votes. And J. Maynard, K5ZC of Fairmont, Minnesota, picked up 93 votes. Nelson is North Dakota section manager, while Stahlkamp is South Dakota section manager. In the Atlantic Division, now headed by director Tom Abernathy, W3TOM, who qualified for re-election, ARRL members chose Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, as vice director. In the final tally, Hollingsworth of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, received 2,559 votes, while Lloyd Roach, K3QNT, of Bedford, Pennsylvania, gathered 1,348 votes. Hollingsworth had served as FCC Special Counsel overseeing amateur radio enforcement. In the Midwest Division, Director Rod Bloxham, K0DAS, was challenged for re-election by Cecil Miller, WB0RIW of Wichita, Kansas. The winner was Bloxham with 1,249 votes, while Miller tallied 792. Vice Director Art Ziegelbaum, K0AIZ, was unopposed for re-election. Bloxham was appointed Midwest Division Vice Director in 2010. Subsequently, he filled the vacancy created when then Midwest Division Director Bruce Fromm, K0BJ, was elected as ARRL Second Vice President. Running unopposed for new terms were Delta Division Director David Norris, K5UZ, Vice Director Ed Hugens, WB4RHQ, Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK, and Vice Director Tom Delaney, W8WTD. The Ethics and Elections Committee established the eligibility of all candidates and declared all unopposed candidates elected for three-year terms starting January 1, 2018. One ARRL section will welcome a new section manager when the new year begins, while incumbent section managers will continue to head five others. In western Massachusetts, Raymond LaJoy, KB1LRL of Lunenburg, will become the new section manager in January. He was the only candidate nominated for the position by the time the September 8th deadline arrived. He will succeed Ed Emko, W1KT, the current SM, who has decided not to run for another term after leading the Western Mass field organization since 2006. These incumbent section managers were the only valid nominees and have been declared re-elected. J. Van Martin, W4JVM of Alabama, Ray Hollenbeck, KL1L of Alaska, Bill Duvenek, KB3KYH from Delaware, Ron Cowan, KB0DTI from Kansas, and Keith Miller, N9DGK from Tennessee. New two-year terms of office commence on January 1st. No section manager elections took place this fall. No section manager nominations have been received from East Bay, Michigan, New Mexico, or Santa Barbara sections. Jim Latham, AF6AQ, has served as East Bay since 2008. Larry Camp, WB8R, has served as Michigan SM since 2012. Ed James, KA8MJW, as New Mexico's section manager since 2015. And Jim Fortney, K6IYK, as Santa Barbara's manager since 2006. All four decided not to run for new terms in their respective sections. ARRL will resolicit nominations for section manager candidates for those four sections in the January and February issues of QST for 18-month terms of office beginning in July of 2018. Section manager nomination forms and related information is available on the ARRL website. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. 
I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm speaking with Bob Allison, WB1GCM, the ARRL Laboratory Assistant Manager. And I have a question for you, Bob. Okay. What is a key click? A key click is when a transmitter uh, is using Morse code, and as you press the Morse code key down and up, up and down, an audible click is heard on adjacent frequencies, sometimes up an entire ham band. Really? Yes, and uh, that's a that's a no no to the FCC, and quite annoying to anybody who's a, a few kilohertz away, ten, twenty, hundred kilohertz away. Sometimes, if the key clicks are bad enough, or if the signal's strong enough. Well, now people will often say, "Yeah, but that was something that happened with old transmitters." That's that's not the case today. Is that true? Mm, with most manufactured sets, uh, it usually doesn't happen. However, there are plenty of uh, smaller operations, businesses especially in the QRP market, whereas um, the, there are, there's a key click problem. And we've had a number of small companies that, have, that we've uh, done product reviews on, and their little transmitters have the key clicks. And what we do is we, we talk to that manufacturer, that small mom and pop operation. You know, they got to shape that waveform just a little bit. Uh, the key click is caused because there is zero rise time from when the RF is off, and then you press the key down, the RF is now on, and immediately that RF appears. So if you see it on a scope, it's straight up and down, basically. Straight up and down like a block. In fact, the rise time and the fall time, that is the rise time of how long it takes for the waveform to go from zero to full RF power. If that rise time is so quick, it's almost zero milliseconds, it's gonna cause a key click. And usually anything under a millisecond of rise time and fall time will cause a key click. And it'll also cause a wide keying bandwidth. You'll see that chart in QSD product reviews. Does the key click phenomenon become worse at higher keying speeds or not? You know, uh, my own experience and experimentation has proved that it's the rise and fall time of the keying waveform that causes the key clicks and the wide keying sidebands. Well, let's hope that under your guidance, we will have no more key clicks. Well, you don't want to do that. And, you know, if you put a, an amplifier on a little transmitter and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to get it up to 10 watts. Now you have a 10 watt clicky transmitter. So and you'll be very annoying to others by using such a transmitter. I so, bet. Well, so if we find one that comes across the bench here at the ARO laboratory, we let the manufacturer know about that. And most of the time they fix that. Very good. Thank you, Bob. Medium Wave broadcast listeners recently reported a signal with continuous music and announcements on 648 kilohertz, the frequency of the former pirate broadcaster and soon-to-be reconstituted Radio Caroline. Listeners from the UK, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, and Austria reported hearing the signal. Some reports, according to Mike Terry of the SWL in Post, referred to a co-channel Romanian or Slovenian station. Terry said he believed the testing was done at a lower power level than the permitted one kilowatt. Our initial engineering tests on 648 have now finished, Radio Caroline announced on its website. Full tests and programs will commence in due course and will be announced here. We are grateful for the many reception reports sent. So many were received that it will take some time to assess them all. The latter-day incarnation of the famous shipboard pirate radio station that beamed rock music to the UK in the 1960s and 70s has gone legal and obtained a license to operate permanently on 648 kilohertz at 1 kilowatt ERP. That channel falls between the 10 kilohertz spaced AM standard broadcast band frequencies in the US. It's taken Radio Caroline 53 years to get an AM license, and it was perceived as a threat to the BBC for many years, Radio Caroline said on its website. Ironically, 648 kilohertz was best known for transmitting the BBC World Service in English. BBC dropped that service in 2011. And now, with his segment on working amateur radio satellites, here is AMSAT North America's own Bruce Page, KK5DO. If you are new to satellites and do not have a tracking program, you can use the AMSAT online satellite pass predictions. You can find it on amsat.org. Click on Satellite Info and select Pass Prediction. 
Choose a satellite you would like a prediction for and enter your grid square or lat long. Now you're ready to go outside and see if you can hear the satellite. Please remember, almost all the satellites will have someone on, and if you do not hear activity, it does not mean there is no one there. It means you might not be hearing it. Verify that your downlink frequency is correct. Adjust up or down if necessary for Doppler, and make sure you are pointing your antenna to the correct place. Once you hear activity, wait for an opening and give your call. There's no need to call CQ on an FM satellite. It is simply an FM repeater with a really high antenna. On the sideband birds, you will want to tune around, find yourself, see if you hear the others, and either work them or slide up or down in the passband, and then call CQ when you are in the clear. Lots of fun. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. The twice-delayed launch of the United Launch Alliance Delta II rocket that will transport the AMSAT RAD FXSAT FOX 1B CubeSat, carrying an amateur radio payload and other payloads into orbit, now is set for Saturday, November 18th at 0947 UTC. The Joint Polar Satellite System mission launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base, California, had to be postponed on November 14th due to a range safety hold and high upper-level winds, ULA said in a tweet. The launch had to be put off on November 6th due to a faulty battery on the booster. AMSAT will blog on the launch in real time on launch day, and NASA TV will cover the event. Rad FXSAT is one of four CubeSats making up this NASA educational launch. Rad FXSAT is one of four CubeSats making up this NASA educational launch of NanoSatellite's mission, riding as secondary payloads aboard the JPSS-1 mission. Rad FXSAT is a partnership with Vanderbilt University's Institute for Space and Defense Electronics and hosts four payloads for the study of radiation effects on commercial off-the-shelf components. It will carry a FOX1 style FM UV repeater with an uplink on 435.250 MHz with a 67.0 Hz CTCSS tone and a downlink on 145.960 MHz. Satellite and experiment telemetry will be downlinked via the DUV subaudible telemetry stream, which can be decoded using FoxTelem software. AMSAT will have more information on the launch and its early operations, and it will post the first telemetry reception. More launch updates are available from ULA via Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, hashtags Delta2 and hashtag JPSS1. Meanwhile, progress continues on getting future FOX payloads into space. On November 6th, AMSAT Vice President Engineering Jerry Buxton, N0JY, delivered FOX-1D to Spaceflight Inc. in Seattle, where it was integrated into its Innovative Solutions in Space Quad Pack for delivery to India. FOX-1D will launch on the next ISRO Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle flight, scheduled to take place by the end of December. In addition to the FOX-1 UV-FM transponder, FOX-1D will carry several university experiments, including a MEMS gyro from Pennsylvania State University, Erie, a camera from Virginia Tech, and the University of Iowa's High Energy Radiation CubeSat Instrument Radiation Mapping Experiment. FOX-1D also carries the AMSAT L-band downshifter, which gives the option of utilizing a 1.2 GHz uplink for the FM transponder. The NASA ELANA XX mission that will carry RAD FXSAT 2 FOX-1E into orbit will take place no earlier than the end of next March, AMSAT reported recently. The ELANA XX mission will carry 12 CubeSats constructed by NASA and by several universities around the U.S. The mission will be launched by Virgin Galactic on its Launcher 1 air launch to orbit system from Mojave, California. 
like Rad FX Sat Fox 1B, Rad FX Sat 2 is a partnership opportunity between Vanderbilt University's ISED and AMSAT and will carry a similar radiation effects experiment studying new FinFET technology. Rad FX Sat 2 will be the fifth Fox 1 satellite built by AMSAT. Fox 1A, now AMSAT Oscar 85, was launched on October 8, 2015, and is fully operational, providing science data on its outboard experiments and FM transponder service for the amateur radio community. Fox 1 Cliff and Fox 1D are scheduled to launch soon. The RADFX Sat 2 spacecraft bus will be built on the Fox 1 series, but will feature a linear transponder upgrade to replace the standard FM transponder used in Fox 1A through Fox 1D. In addition, the uplink and downlink bands will be reversed from the previous Fox satellites in a mode UV-J. The downlink will feature a 1200 BPS BPSK telemetry channel to carry the Vanderbilt science data in addition to a 30 kilohertz wide transponder for amateur radio use. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. While tower climbing safety is a topic of my segment on This Week in Amateur Radio, anything we can do to reduce the amount of trips up a tower leads to increased safety because you can't fall off a tower you don't climb. Over the years, as both a professional climber and a repeater owner, I learned from personal experience how important securing coax to the tower and antenna can be. Trial and error, experimentation, and failure mode analysis have been good teachers. When installing coax on any support structure, tower, or even an antenna mast on a chimney mount, how you secure the coax to the support has a direct effect on how long it will last without failure. First, you need to know what type of coax you're installing. Some are designed to be flexible, some are more rigid. Belden 9913 is somewhat rigid feed line, 9913 Flexi and the RG8 family are somewhat flexible, meaning they are designed to be wiggled from time to time. Another issue is the movement of the center conductor as the coax heats and cools with the passage of the sun. If you use cable TV hardline, this effect can be extreme. So we examine the route we intend to take with the feed line at both ends of the support structure. This can be very important when using the more rigid or more shrink prone feed lines. At the lower end, the more rigid coax needs support. The goal of the support should be to minimize or eliminate flexing caused by mother nature. In other words, by wind or weight of snow. In one installation, we used the length of three quarter inch conduit as a support between the tower and the ham shack to hang the coax and wires. Every installation is going to be a little bit different. Now at the top of the coax, the route from the tower to the antenna is most critical because this end tends to move more than at the bottom. If your antenna is side mounted, keep the coax attached to something like the tower's cross members or whatever else is available to add support. What you want to do is avoid any section of coax that is hanging in the wind and able to wobble in the worst of storms. Over time, this is where failures are likely to occur. I also recommend a stress loop of coax near the antenna to allow for center conductor movement, and some folks believe this tends to trap much of the energy of a lightning strike. When you make a few loops of coax, be sure to secure different points of the loop to the tower, mast, or sidearm so it isn't flopping in the wind either. I have found that the more rigid coax with the foil shield, when flexed repeatedly, the foil cracks and when the wind blows, this can create a crackling interference sound in the received signal's audio. This can happen even when the coax has foil and wire braid outer conductor. So there it is in a nutshell. Support, support, support. Use flexible coax whenever possible, but avoid any unsupported runs vertically or horizontally at the top or at the bottom of the tower, mast, or whatever you're putting your antennas on. The more you secure and waterproof, the longer it'll last and the less you'll climb, which is safer. Remember to plan your antenna work around safety. This is Greg Stoddard, Kilo Fox 9 Mike Papa reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio.
ARRL Contest Branch Manager Bart Yonke, W9JJ, has clarified that the new 630 and 2200 meter bands will be fair territory in the ARRL International Grid Chase. For more details on this exciting new contest, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from ARRL headquarters in Newington. The year-long operating event begins on January 1st, 2018 at midnight UTC. The object is to work stations in as many Maidenhead grid squares as possible, and radio amateurs around the world are encouraged to take part. Contacts made on the 60-meter band will not be eligible for award credit, however. U.S. radio amateurs are advised that the use of 630 meters and 2200 meters does require advance notification to the Utilities Technology Council of their intention to operate on one or both bands. If UTC does not respond within 30 days or specifically deny access, these stations may commence operation. Once approved to use either 630 meters, 2200 meters, or both, U.S. radio amateurs must adhere to the FCC rules regarding the use of those bands. Specifically, amateurs operating on 472 to 479 kilohertz may run up to 5 watts equivalent radiated power, except in parts of Alaska within 496 miles of Russia, where the maximum would be 1 watt. Amateurs operating in the 135.7 to 137.8 kHz band will be permitted to run up to 1 watt equivalent radiated power. The FCC has placed a 60 meter above ground level height limit on transmitting antennas used on 630 meters and 2200 meters. The bands would be available to general class and higher licensees using CW, RTTY, data, phone, and image. Any contact you make in 2018, with the exception of contacts on 60 meters, can now count towards your international grid chase score, and contacts do not have to include an exchange of grid squares. Participants upload their logs to Logbook of the World, and as long as the other operators worked used to LTW, they will get credit automatically once they upload their logs. This means that contacts will also count, as will contacts with special event stations or other on-the-air activities that use LOTW to confirm contacts. Get in touch with the ARRL Contest Branch for more information. We have a big contest weekend on tap with the phone portion of the ARRL November Sweepstakes kicking off at 2100 UTC on Saturday, November 18th. According to sources, a few operators will be on the air from the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, so a clean sweep is possible. Two weekends later, we have the ARRL 160-meter contest starting on Friday, December 1st at 2200 UTC. The ARRL 160-meter contest is an all-CW event, with ARRL and radio amateurs of Canada sections plus DX entities counting as multipliers. If you live in a rare section, you will be popular even if you don't have a big signal on 160. The DARC reports that effective November 11th, 2017, radio amateurs in Germany were permitted to use the new 60-meter band and an extended 6-meter band. Amateur radio will be assigned the frequency range 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz with a maximum allowed radiated power of 15 watts EIRP on a secondary basis. In addition, the frequency band 50.08 to 51 MHz previously allocated to the amateur radio service on a secondary basis will be increased to 50.03 to 51 MHz. The maximum permitted radiation power here is 25 watts ERP. The National Society Icelandic Radio Amateurs had proposed ending the practice of highlighting amateurs who had novice call signs with an N added to their call sign. In addition, the IRA proposed ending another discriminatory practice where Icelandic call signs reflected the geographic call area where a station is located. The Post and Telecom Administration's new draft radio regulations incorporate the IRA's request and the frequency allocation table has been updated to include the 630-meter and 60-meter bands. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the ARRL Propagation Forecast for Friday, November the 17th. After 13 days, we finally have a single sunspot rotating into view. Its magnetic fields appear to be stable, so no flares are in the forecast, at least at this time. Considering the fact that we're deep into a solar minimum, conditions are not all that bad for sweepstakes weekend. The solar flux index has risen to about 75, 
And even though the solar winds continue to blow, we can probably expect decent conditions on 80, 40, and 20 meters. 15 and even 10 meters might have a few surprises in store as well. On the VHF and UHF bands, look for tropo ducting that may bring band openings in Northern California, as well as Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. Hi, I'm Gene Shepard, and I know that millions of you have listened to me on the radio, but do you know that hundreds of thousands of people can talk back to me on their radios? It's called ham radio. Now, I'm an amateur. I'm a ham radio operator, and I have been one since 12. And in fact, I got started in broadcasting through just being interested in ham radio and getting on the air. And if you're a kid, or even if you're a retiree, ham radio is a perfect hobby for you if you're interested in the world. By the way, if you're a youngster, you get interested uh, through this hobby in things like computers and satellites and all kinds of high-tech equipment. But if you're an oldster, you can talk to people all over the world from your home. Wonderful hobby. So get in touch with the American Radio Relay League, Newington, Connecticut, 06111. They'll send you all a dope on it. Become a ham. What a hobby. Start it today. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California, This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is show number one, hour number one, segment number three, a 10-minute, big 10-minute segment in three, two, one. Lately, I've been kind of uh, bemused, maybe depressed, maybe a little saddened, looking around as you see everybody walking and staring at their phones these days and living their life on the, uh, on the Internet and the social media. And it's hard not to, as an older person, get cranky and say, oh, you young people, you're missing life. You're missing out on the world around us. I guess I guess the, one of the founders of Facebook must be feeling the same way. Sean Parker. I wouldn't say he's an old person, but he's getting older. He was uh, he was quoted this week basically apologizing for creating Facebook. He was Facebook's first president. Remember, it was Mark Zuckerberg who created, but Sean Parker came along. He'd had experience with Napster, knew how to run it. He's the guy in the movie who said, "You know what's better than a million dollars? Billion dollars." Of course, that was the movie. I don't know if that's uh, that's what he really said, but he certainly helped Facebook become what it is. And now he kind of maybe he kind of regrets it. Interview with Axios, he said, "When Facebook, this is uh, this is Sean Parker talking. When Facebook was getting going, I'd had these people would come up to me and they would say, I am not on social media, no.' And I would say, "Okay, you know you will be." Parker says. And then they would say, no, 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 I value my real life interactions. I value the moment. I value presence. I value intimacy. And I would say, we'll get you eventually. He was right, right? He says, I don't know, though, if I really understood the consequences of what I was saying. Because of what happens when the network gets to a billion or two billion people, it literally changes your relationship with society, with each other. It probably, says Sean Parker, one of the guys who created Facebook, interferes with your productivity in weird ways. Yes and your sleep, and your relationship with your children and your family. God only knows, he says, what it's doing to our children's brains. The thought process, this is actually a great insight and important to understand uh, uh, about why Facebook, and, you know, you could say this about Twitter and, you know, just the Internet in general. The thought process, he says, that went into building those applications, Facebook being the first of them, was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible? They, that's what they optimize for. They call it engagement. But what it is, is your attention. The more you spend on Facebook, the more attention you pay, the more they can make in advertising, the happier they are. And it's not, I don't think it's, I don't even want to ascribe greed to them. I mean, you know, it's a somewhat profitable business, but I don't think they do it for greed. I think Mark is genuine, Mark Zuckerberg, when he says, I just want people to connect. But what he, what he probably would be more honest to say, I just want people to connect on my platform, right? Where he might hear. On, I, I don't think he cares about connecting anywhere else. He certainly doesn't care about connecting in real life. He wants people to connect on Facebook. He wants more of your time, more of your intention. He wants your engagement. Sean Parker says, the way we do that, we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit. You know, a little boing to the pleasure center every once in a while. Boing. Ooh. 
because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever, and that's going to get you to contribute more content, and that's going to get you more likes and comments. It's a social validation feedback loop, exactly the kind of thing a hacker like me would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. The inventors, the creators, it's me, says Sean Parker, it's Mark Zuckerberg, it's Kevin Systrom on Instagram, it's all these people understood this consciously, and we did it anyway. And I'm sure that they told themselves, and they still tell themselves, well, it's for the benefit of society, because if we're all connected, if we're all, you know, talking to each other, good things will happen. And we've seen that's true, and bad things, too, will happen. I think it comes down to, though, I've been thinking about this, because I don't, I, you know, this show's about technology. We want to talk about the benefits of technology, how to use technology, how to, you know, so you can use it better, so you can use it to your advantage, not disadvantage. So I'm not anxious to say that, well, get off the internet. <laughs> it's bad for you. But I think, I, I think I'm but thinking about the problem, and I think I understand now a little bit about what's going on, and maybe there is a ray of light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, the two words I'd use are uncanny valley, the real versus the synthetic. So in our, you know, our lives, let's, let's call our lives real, shall we? <laughs> our interactions with humans in, in the flesh when you're face to face, that's real. We'll call that the real thing. But even going back to the very earliest humans, back to the people living in caves, they wanted to create art, I guess you'd call it. They wanted to create a pseudo reality. They painted on the caves. They painted the hunt. They painted... Paintings, beautiful paintings, if you look at the Lascaux caves of, of animals being hunted from the very beginning. And we've created, that's what art is, isn't it? Art is creating a simulation of real life in a way that kind of tugs at your attention, tugs at your emotions, your feelings, gets your, grabs your eye, makes you think. And that's really, in a way, I think that's, that's what, that's the creative impetus Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook felt. Not so much to Get, grab your money, but to create something that you would be engaged in just as an artist creates a painting or a playwright creates a play or a TV show to engage you when an actor's on a stage that we know that's not real life. That's a simulation. But there's this problem when you make simulations and that's the uncanny valley. When you make a simula, in fact, you've, you've seen it when you make uh, when, when Pixar did a toy story, they very smart, very wise decision not to show humans so much as toys. Because you can make a, a, a 3G, 3, 3D animated Mr. Potato Head that doesn't creep you out. It looks like Mr. Potato Head. But when you do it with a human, remember that movie Polar Express, the Tom Hanks movie, where they try to, it's a children's story, but they try to make the characters look like humans, and it was creepy. It was weird, right? You look at those, and you, or if you've ever played, and this is what made me start thinking about it. I've been playing the new Xbox Scorpio, which is 4K, high dynamic range. You know, all of what we've done with video games, all even into virtual realities to try to make it more real. But there's something about the human brain is very good at detecting fakes, synthetic. And it just is a little unsettling. I was playing uh, Call of Duty World War II, and you're, you know, you're landing on the beach at Normandy. And it's very vivid, except that the people look kind of creepy and weird because of that uncanny valley. They don't quite make that leap from synthetic to real. We're not good enough yet. So maybe that's why we get discomfited maybe now by social networks and the connections we're having. They're not real, are they? They're, the connection you make with somebody on Facebook is, is a synthetic connection. It's close to real, but it's a little unsettling because it's not quite as good as face-to-face -face shaking somebody's hand, giving them a hug. But maybe we're going to get better at that. Certainly, there that's what Silicon Valley is working towards. That's what virtual reality is all about. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? Number one classic thing you must not do in file recovery. And it's easy to understand if I explain that when you delete a file on any operating system, it doesn't actually scrub the data away unless you do a secure deletion app Ma apple for instance on a mac os has an option to secure delete files and what what a secure deletion will do is well let me start with what a normal deletion will do and in, in every case android ios mac os windows is it'll merely release that area of the drive and say eh, this can be used again it doesn't actually erase the data the data is all still there secure delete will then overwrite the data and by doing so make sure that no recovery tool can recover it. And therein lies a little hint about what not to do. When you're recovering hard drives using a tool like Recover, which is free, I also mentioned, uh, I told them about PC Inspector, PCinspector.de. 
Uh, that's made actually by a company that makes SD cards, so it's it's kind of designed for SD cards. Those tools will go out, look for files that have been released but not overwritten, and it'll say, oh, yeah, there was a file here. The data is still here. In Windows, the way they release a file, they take the file name, they take the first letter of the file name, the first byte, and they turn it into an upside-down E. That's it. That's all they do, and then the file system says, oh, good, I can use this. It's the directory entries even there. It's just got an upside-down E as the first letter. So the file system says, oh, I can use that. Uh, I'm not sure what Android does or other operating systems, but it's effectively something like that. Just a little flag. Cause they, cause why? Because you want to make it fast. If you ever delete you know, a, a folder with a 1,000 files in it, it's like that, isn't it? Well, that's because it's not overwriting them. It's just turning the first letter upside down all the way through. That's fast. That's easy. It takes seconds. But that's a good thing because it means the data is still there. But the cardinal rule in file recovery is you don't recover to the drive you're recovering because then you're overwriting stuff. See, remember, the file system says, this drive's empty. I could put stuff anywhere. So if you're recovering a drive, if you've lost files or you've erased files on a drive by accident, you you if generally the, in a forensics environment where it's critical that not, that data not be lost, let's say a bad guy has a folder inside that folder all the banks I've robbed. And he says, oh, the cops are coming and erases. The cops get the hard drive. First thing they do is make a bite for bite exact copy of that drive. And then they put the drive aside. They don't touch it. And they work on the copy. That way there's no chance they'll accidentally overwrite the data or damage it in any way. Then they can use their file recovery tools safely on the copy. So the key when you're trying to recover something, let's say from an SD card like that, is to not write to the SD card. That's why you don't do it in the phone. You take it out, you put it in an adapter, you put it in a computer, and you and when you do the recovery, you tell, and most recovery tools are smart enough to do this, you tell the recovery tool, don't recover to the drive I'm, rec I'm recovering. Recover to my internal hard drive, please. Don't touch that drive. That drive, lock it. Don't touch it because that's where the data lies. So uh, cardinal rule number one in file recovery, do not <laughs> recover the data to the, the disk you're recovering from because then you'll overwrite other data. Once that happens, there's not much you can do we talk a lot about, oh, the Department of Defense. <laughs> Actually, my favorite is the British MI5 rules for secure data deletion. They take a hard drive that's got secret stuff on it. They do secure deletion, which means they don't just erase, turn the first letter of the name upside down. They actually write ones across the whole drive, then erase it, then write zeros across the whole drive, then erase it. And they may do that 8, 9, 10, 20 times. Then... <laughs> They take the platters out of the drive, they grind them down into dust, they put them in a vault in the basement of the MI5 building, and they leave them there. That's that's secure. That's pretty secure. But I think, and I've looked at lots of people, once you overwrite data, you really can't get it back. You'd need some pretty specialized gear that was very sensitive that would be able to say, well, those are zeros. But there's a faint electronic, because it's magnetic, right? There's a faint little trace of magnetism that looks like it's a O. Oh, that must be the original. No one's ever seen this. <laughs> and many security experts have tried to duplicate that, and I don't think anybody's ever succeeded. Rule, another rule. Here's a cardinal rule number two. Back up your data. And the easiest way on a smartphone, the automatic way, put a program on your computer that does that, uh, on your phone that does that. I use Google's Photos. That's free. It'll back up unlimited video and pictures automatically, instantly to the Google Cloud where they're stored safely. Amazon, if you're a Prime member, they have the same program. Uh, Microsoft's OneDrive will do that. Dropbox will do that. If you want a belt and suspenders, have Dropbox and Google. Because you lose, phones get lost, SD cards stop working. It's not unusual. It can happen. Be very careful when you're doing data recovery. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. Warren Pugh, KC9IL, has worked a handful of countries digitally using FT8, the latest craze in amateur radio digital modes. Last week, we brought you the first of two excerpts from an interview with Warren by Rains Hapali, KC9RP. This week, we bring the conclusion of their conversation. I would imagine that the use of these digital modes in the emergency communications field would be really good. Some of them are appropriate and some of them are not. The JTs and FTA are probably not appropriate for that because of the very limited amount of data that you can transmit. 
Again, as I mentioned earlier, these contacts are call sign, grid square, signal report, very, very basic. There are other modes, however, some of the MFSK modes that do much better with keyboard text freeform information. Even things like FSQ, Fast Simple QSO, written by Murray Greenman. That's a free chat mode. And you can just type in whatever your message is, you hit the enter button and away it goes. So it's almost like messaging on your cellular telephone. Uh, so there are some modes that have error correction that would be more appropriate if the information must be absolutely correct. Where some of these other modes, they do not have error correction. Uh, you can tolerate missing a character here or there. It's not crucial, but in certain emergency services and disaster relief where every message has to be perfect, they might not be appropriate. Do all the digital modes operate essentially in the same part of each band? You mentioned 14074 is a frequency. How wide is that segment that you'll find these digital modes? Well, they will differ depending on the band. Let's pick 40 meters, for example. You'll find PSK down around 7.030. And then you'll find other modes up around 7.070. And then the JTs and FT will be starting at 7074, 7076, 7078. It's different by different bands, but in general, they're going to be in the CW and data part of the band, so you won't find these modes in the phone part of the band. But you have a segment. So, for example, FT8 is a 2 kilohertz wide segment, roughly the size of a single sideband voice channel. But in that space, you can have 20 to 30 QSOs going on simultaneously because of the width of these signals. An FT8 signal is about 48 cycles wide. A JT9 signal is, I think, less than 20, maybe 16 or 17 cycles wide. So if you look at these on a spectrum scope, you see all these yellow lines on the pan adapter, if you will, or the fish finder, as I like to call it. And they don't bother each other. They're not interfering with each other. You don't need to change the frequency on your radio. You just set it for 7.074, for example, and depending on where you click on the waterfall display is where you will be. So it's pretty efficient to be able to have 20 or 30 QSOs going on in the single space of one voice channel allows more people to get on. And as you know, half QRM becomes a problem, especially during busy weekends. This allows people to stay in a fairly small area and not be bothered that all much and carry on. So you can get on FT8, for example, and just start running. That's actually my favorite way to go. Start calling CQ, somebody answers you back, you answer them, thank you, QRZ, do it again. You can knock out you know, a dozen QSOs or more in a very short period of time. It's a lot of fun. It takes a lot of the work out of it for you. FT8 has some automation in it that it knows what exchange comes next. So you can literally sit back and just watch it go. Are there digital contests? There are some digital contests. I haven't seen JT contests yet, but for example, there's RIDI contests been around for a long, long time. There are PSK31 contests. All of these modes are uh, acceptable in things like field day, although JT9, JT65, because of the lengthy amount of time it takes to complete a contact, they probably aren't terribly popular for field day. But I have to believe that for field day 2018, you're going to see a lot of FT8 going on. What do you recommend for the software for FT8? I'm not aware of anything other than Joe Taylor's software, which is WSJT-X. The WS is weak signal, Joe Taylor. So WSJT-X, it is a free download. If you Google WSJTX, you can find the links to it, but it, it's on his uh, Harvard website. It's free software. It's an easy download. If you are operating any digital modes now, you're good to go. You know, All you really need is obviously your computer. You need some sort of sound interface. I like the Rig Blaster series, but there are others from MFJ and from Tigertronics, the Signal Link. But some way to couple your transmit and receive audio 
into your computer so the sound card can do its magic, and then just a way to control the key up of the radio. And, and that's all done by the software. So if you've got something like a rig blaster, you are good to go. You set your levels just like you would set for any other of these digital data modes. Turn off your compression and speech processing. Make sure that there's virtually no ALC action so you don't overdrive the thing and cause splatter and distortion because then you're not being a good neighbor. But it's fairly simple to go. And as I said, if you are already operating any of these sound card modes, like RIDI or PSK or JT, you are ready to go. You just download this software, fire it up, tune your radio to the appropriate frequencies, and uh, have at it. I have a five-year-old radio. It's a Kedwin TS-480 for HF. How well will that do on the digital modes? It should do fine. None of these modes are exceptionally critical of frequency stability. Now, you don't want to be drifting up and down the band, but if your radio is reasonably stable, and, and what I've read indicates that any radio that's within the last 20 years or so should be stable enough to operate these modes, you don't need a lot of fancy filtering. Actually, they suggest that you turn off all your DSP on receive, widen it up as wide as your upper sideband voice channel allows, and, and you do run these modes using upper sideband. And let the software do its work. You don't need a high-performance receiver to work these modes. The software is what's doing all the heavy lifting. You have prepared a presentation on FT8. It was primarily the new software, the WSJT-X and FT8. I did reference some other modes in there just for comparison as far as how wide they are, what the data rate is, how sensitive they are, but it was primarily FT8. Where can someone find that presentation to download it? Well, I was able to record the audio from the presentation I did to the North Shore Radio Club a couple of weeks ago, and that's been put up on our club's website, which is uh, ns9rc.org, ns9rc.org. The um, PDF version of the PowerPoint is there and then the audio file of the roughly 45 minute presentation is there. We also did a live on air demo via TeamViewer, which you can hear, but I'll have to leave it to the listener's imagination to see what was going on there. But if somebody wants to listen to that presentation, they can download it and listen ns9rc.org. And in reviewing that audio file, I did realize that I had a couple of misstatements there. So people who are particularly astute will catch me on those. My recollection wasn't perfect and I misquoted something, but in general, you should be able to visualize where I was on the screen and what we were saying. But it's certainly helpful. And I've gotten word from some folks who've downloaded who were not able to attend and he said, it's almost as good as being there. So I would certainly encourage folks if they want to learn more and see some of the material they can get them at our website. I think we should thank people like Joe Taylor, who he has a day job doing things like astronomy, but for him to take the time to write a piece of software like this, to have it accepted is, you know, we should be very grateful for guys like that. Go out and enjoy it, push the boundaries, see how low can you go, how weak can you get. Uh, there's a, a certain amount of satisfaction of being able to work somebody thousands of miles away, getting thousands of miles per watt, as opposed to firing up the kilowatt and talking to Australia, and that's eight miles per watt. Wonderful. But in these modes, you can do two, three, four thousand miles per watt. And uh, it just opens it up to people who may not think they are capable of operating HF and DX. Go for it and have fun. And that concludes our conversation with inveterate digital devotee Warren Pugh, KC9IL who provided us a cursory look at FT8, the latest and greatest digital mode to hit HF in quite a spell. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. Foundations of Amateur Radio Last week, I spent a little time talking about the Weak Signal Propagation Reporters Network, or WSPR, pronounced WHISPER. You might remember that I set up my radio to receive these signals to see what I could learn. Turns out, I learned quite a bit. I left the software running for a week. 
During that time, my station reported 456 signals received, with a total of 54 stations in 27 call areas. The longest distance was 14,000 kilometers. Papa Charlie 1 Juliet Bravo in Veenendaal in the Netherlands, who was using 1 watt. The best performance, based on kilometer per watt, is Romeo Zero Alpha Golf Lima in Siberia, 10,000 kilometers with 2 milliwatt. Highest power heard, one station with 100 watts, but from a performance perspective, only just squeaks into the top 10 contacts. Typically, stations used 5 watt or less. My 10 metre quarter wave vertical antenna was pretty good in hearing things across all bands. I heard stations across the frequency range from 160 metres through to 10 metres. It heard one station on 160 metres, Victor Kilo 7 Mike Foxtrot, using 5 watts, 3,000 kilometres away. The most prolific band was 40 metres, accounting for 41% of the signals. 30 metres was pretty close at 35%, and even 10 metres was respectable with 5% of signals heard on that band. Which brings me to a comment about propagation. The solar flux index this week was pretty abysmal. It's been the lowest it's ever been, 66, and still I was able to hear signals across all HF bands. Just think about that for a moment. All the solar numbers say the bands are dead. All the listening in the world says the bands are dead. But using Whisper reveals that this isn't true. It's not even close to being true. My station in a very high noise environment still heard signals across all bands. Based on a visual comparison with other stations, signals were generated in all directions. But for my station, I didn't hear anything coming from the northeast quadrant. That's between north and east. It could be that the signals are being suppressed by the distortion in my antenna pattern, which might be caused by a metal gutter in that direction. Or it might be that signals coming from that direction, mainly Japan and the United States, are too weak to be heard above the noise level at my station. I'm investigating that further, but that's for another day. Speaking of other stations, in total, during the same period as my station listening, there was a total of 6.9 million reports representing 2,490 listeners and 4,463 transmitters. That means that I heard just over 1% of stations on my radio. Not bad given my meagre setup and minimal configuration and installation. On to things that I was attempting to learn about the performance of my radio. Every whisper transmission includes the frequency and location information, which allows you to determine what the difference is between what frequency the other station reports and what frequency your radio sees. Of course, there can be variation across both radios, and to make things more interesting, this changes over time. This drift is likely to be distributed pretty evenly across all stations, but then I didn't hear all of them, so my results are not completely definitive. But overall, the drift reports show a frequency drift of minus 3 to plus 2 hertz, slightly skewed down. That's not yet conclusive proof that my station is slightly off frequency, but it seems to indicate that my new crystal is slightly low. I'll be investigating that further. And that neatly brings me to why I have been doing this. You might not be surprised to learn that many things inside your radio are frequency controlled. Those frequencies come from a single central location, a master oscillator that in my radio vibrates at 22.625000 MHz. The crystal that does this is affected by temperature. When you transmit, the radio heats up, and the frequency of the crystal changes slightly. Normally this isn't an issue, but if you're working on being on a particular frequency, especially on the 2 meter or 70 centimeter band, then this starts to matter. If you leave your radio running for a few hours, things are likely to be more stable, since the temperature in your radio becomes more stable. Another way to do this is to control the crystal temperature directly. You can insulate it, or heat it in a little oven, or a combination of both. This is a so-called Temperature Controlled External Oscillator, a TCXO. It's more stable, and thus over time the frequency shouldn't change much. In my case, the range is 5 Hz, and as I said, it's slightly skewed down. The next step is to measure the actual frequency that my radio is tuned to. This will require a little more effort. I'll talk about that next week. 
In the meantime, I'm doing some more analytics to compare how my noise floor affects my station, how it compares to other stations across the same time range, and how little changes in volume, antenna and the like affect what results I get. There is lots of data to digest, lots of knowledge buried among the stats, and I'll be spending the coming weeks seeing if there are things here of a wider interest. One thing's for sure, this is the simplest way you can measure and compare your station against a whole globe of other stations. Of course, it doesn't actually get you on air to make noise, and that is the ultimate test of the success of a station. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. International Amateur Radio Union President Tim Elam, VE6SH, G4HUA, has praised the value of the IARU's participation over the years in the International Telecommunication Union, International Radio Consultative Committee, and various ITU radio communication sector study groups. CCIR was the forerunner to ITUR. In an article, the International Amateur Radio Union, in the latest issue of ITU News Magazine, Elam said the IARU has been a regular contributor to the CCIR and ITUR study groups and working parties on behalf of the world's radio amateur community. This year marks the 90th anniversary of CCIR-ITUR study groups. The IARU was first admitted to the work of CCIR in 1932. The relationship is mutually beneficial, Elam wrote. The amateur and amateur satellite services offer private citizens the opportunity to intercommunicate and experiment with radio transmission to increase their personal knowledge and skills. Radio amateurs provide communications at no cost with their own equipment in the event of natural disasters. They share what they learn with one another and with the wider telecommunications community, in part through ITU recommendations and reports. ITU Study Group 5 and Working Party 5A are home to both the amateur and the amateur satellite services. ITUR study groups met this past week in the run-up to World Radio Communication Conference 2019. Working Group 5A1, chaired by Dale Hughes, VK1DSH, is responsible for WRC19 Agenda Item 1.1, which is looking into a 50 to 54 megahertz band allocation in Region 1, harmonized with the allocations in Regions 2 and 3. ITUR Recommendation M.1732, Characteristics of Systems Operating in the Amateur and Amateur Satellite Services for Use in Sharing Studies, was developed by and updated in WP-5A. The IARU also participates as appropriate in other working parties of Study Group 5, Elam explained. ITUR also maintains the standard for international Morse code characters and operational provisions, Elam pointed out. He noted that while radio amateurs experiment with advanced digital coding and signal processing techniques, they are also the world's largest group of regular international Morse code users. Elam said unwanted emissions that lead to interference, sometimes called spectrum pollution, are of growing concern to radio amateurs. The radio spectrum is an irreplaceable natural resource, he said. Unintended and unnecessary radio frequency emissions from poorly maintained electrical power lines and poorly designed electronic devices and systems can cause interference that degrades the capacity of the radio spectrum to support communication. Elam said that as new technologies such as wireless power transmission are developed and deployed, it's essential that the highest possible priority be given to developing and implementing standards to prevent radio spectrum pollution. Elam said an increasing number of short mission non-geostationary satellites are being proposed for operation in the limited amateur satellite allocations inconsistent with the objectives of the Amateur Satellite Service. He said the IARU appreciates efforts within ITUR working parties to identify more suitable spectrum for telemetry, tracking, and command of these satellites at WRC-19. 
the IARU congratulates the ITUR study groups for continuing to build on the magnificent record of the CCIR in furthering the advancement of radio communication, Elam concluded. Elam is an invited panel Elam is an invited panelist at the 90th anniversary celebration of the CCIR ITUR study groups on November 21st in Geneva. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Software defined radio, or SDR pioneer Vanu Gopal Bose, died on November 11th after suffering a sudden pulmonary embolism. He was 52. Bose was the son of Bose Corp founder Amar G. Bose, who died four years ago at age 83. Vanu Bose, in 1998, founded Vanu Incorporated, which pioneered the commercialization of software to find radio, and was the first company to receive FCC certification of an SDR in 2004. The firm's technology grew out of Bose's graduate research at MIT. Father and son were both MIT alumni. Recently, Bose's company deployed more than 40 Community Connect base stations in Puerto Rico to provide cellular service in the wake of two devastating hurricanes. And finally this week, an odd but intriguing experiment in technology, diplomacy, governance, and space exploration, among other things, has officially begun its journey. After being delayed one day, an orbital ATK and Terry's rocket carrying a CubeSat named Asgardia-1 launched from NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia early Sunday. The milk carton-sized satellite makes up the entirety of territory of the self-proclaimed Space Kingdom of Asgardia. Asgardia Space Kingdom has now established its sovereign territory in space, read an online statement. Over 300,000 people signed up online to become citizens of the nation over the last year. The main privilege of citizenship so far involves the right to upload data to Asgardia 1 for safekeeping in orbit, seemingly far away from the pesky governments and law of earthbound countries. But if you really dig down into Asgardia's terms and conditions, you'll find that those privileges are still subject to earthly copyright laws. They're set up under the laws of Austria. As of now, Asgardia's statehood isn't acknowledged by any other actual countries or the United Nations, and it doesn't really even fit the definition of a nation since it's not possible for a human to physically live in Asgardia. Not yet, at least. The long-term vision of Asgardia includes human settlements in space, on the moon, and perhaps even more distant colonies. For now, though, Asgardia is a tiny satellite inside a Cygnus spacecraft set to dock with the International Space Station Tuesday morning. There, Asgardia-1 will patiently wait while Orbital ATK completes its primary mission to resupply the ISS. After about a month, the Cygnus will detach and climb to a higher altitude where the nation in a box will be deployed into orbit. We'll see if the activation of Asgardia-1 heralds the beginning of a new era of extraplanetary citizenship or if it slowly fades into obscurity with each trip around our planet and its nearly 200 more conventional nations. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, amateur radio newsletters from around the world, sources on the Internet, and the packet bulletin board systems of the United States and Canada. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.